migrate and to move from areas of low or decreasing resources to areas of higher or increasing resources. Um, and, what, and one of the main resources we're talking about is food. Nesting locations is another, but, but food, food is a big one. Um, some birds don't migrate at all. They're permanent residents like this uh, black-capped chickadee. These have evolved and adapted to survive the risk of uh, less food um, and, and, and winter weather and be able to withstand the winter weather. Other, other birds in our area like cardinals and wild turkeys and, and downy woodpeckers don't migrate at all. Others migrate somewhat short distances, perhaps only as far as to secure food and escape the worst of the winter weather, uh, maybe just down to the Pennsylvania or the Carolinas, if at all, depending on the severity of the winter. Bluebirds and uh, red-winged blackbirds and grackles and this kingfisher, they generally return to our area earlier, and in fact, they're already back in my area here around Albany, New York. And some um, medium distance migrants, although it seems like quite a feat that they undergo anyway, sometimes called continental migrants, like a lot of our waterfowl or this palm warbler. Um, palm warblers are quite uh, abundant in Florida in the winter. I don't know if any of you have ever, ever spent any time in Florida, but I go down and visit my mom there, and you see a lot of these. And uh, Hi, Mom. Um, so... Uh, I'll show you a map of their distribution. And the blue areas down here, um, that's where they winter in the southeastern United States and the greater Antilles and Bermuda and a little bit even in Mexico, and, uh, and then travel north and, and end up breeding in the boreal areas of Canada and a little bit in the northern United States. Um, there are some other birds that are migrating now, and I've, you probably already know this, but they're, they're spending their, they spent their winters in our area. Um, before they head back to their um, summer homes and breeding grounds in Canada or even the high Arctic, birds like this um, red pole, um, snow buntings, rough-legged hawks, snowy owl, they end up down here, you know, based primarily on the availability of food, um, seeds or cones or, or voles and lemmings and such. Um, if, they, if, if, those, uh, if those populations are low, they'll, they'll spend quite a, bit of, quite a bit of their time in the winter down here. So Birds like that or this American tree sparrow are just leaving now as other migrants are arriving or passing through from the south. And you'll see another map of this tree sparrow. You'll see um, everything just kind of moved north compared to the palm warbler. They, uh, winter, they wintered um, in the northern two-thirds of the United States and then, um, and then move, and will move on and migrate to their uh, breeding grounds in, in northern Canada and Alaska. You know, um, and then, uh, of course, we're going to talk about uh, the stars of our show, the long-distance migrants, the, the neotropical migrants. And these, these creatures have developed amazing risk-reward strategies. You know, the risk, as we've already talked about, is the incredible, dangerous migration they embark on twice a year. But what's the reward, you know? Uh, well, it's a hefty food supply, primarily insects for neotropical migrants. Thanks for eating those mosquitoes there, buddy. Um, fewer predators, um, you know, there's a lot more snakes and reptiles and even more bird-hungry raptors um, in the tropics that they want to get away from. And the milder weather uh, makes for a higher breeding success than their counterparts that remain in the tropics. Um, there's another beautiful neotropical bird, can't wait to have come back, the Scarlet Tanager. And then the Bobolink, one of my favorite. Um, they can be found in large grassy fields in our region. Um, look at this map. They winter, he winters all the way down in Central South America before migrating all the way through most of South America and across the Caribbean and the Gulf and through most of the United States to the northern, what's that, about a third of the United States and, and, and somewhat to Canada. But what a, what a credible journey that that bird has to make twice a year. Well, how do they migrate? Well, they're hard, hardwired to leave. You know, it's evolved over thousands of generations of these birds. There's other factors involved, but the day length and the circadian rhythms, they play a very large part. Uh, weather and temperature doesn't play a big part in, in, in long-distance migration schedules, maybe more so for shorter distance. But, you know, a bird leaving S South America doesn't know what the weather like is in Albany, isn't going to find out till they get here. Um, they're, they're aided by magnetic fields. You know, for a long time, the prevailing theory was that um, there were cells rich in iron in birds' beaks that aided their navigation, you know, like Toucan Sam, follow your nose. But then it was about 50 years ago, uh, it was theorized um, that migratory animals, not just birds, but um, they must contain like a certain molecule in their eyes or brains that responds to the magnetic field. Like maybe they can even see um, the magnetic field of the earth. And it was actually proven just in the last couple of years by two separate research teams that uh, magnetoreception is actually a thing. And birds can see the magnetic field, which answers so many questions to ornithologists and, and researchers and even us to help, you know, peel away the mysteries of this incredible things that they do. Whoops, move backwards on that. Apologize. 
So the timing is critical, critically important, um, for, for especially the arrival dates for these migrants. You know, the males need to arrive early enough to claim the best territories, you know, the ones that have the right makeup of trees and shrubs or grass or tundra and, and, then, and then the associated food for their niche. And, and the females need to arrive in time to claim those unmated males on, on the favorable territories. Um, but if they come too early, you know, they can face weather concerns or lack of food. But despite that fact, so many bird species are facing heavy population declines. There's, there is some good news. They can adapt. Um, in fact, a number of, uh, quite a few of the uh, migratory species are arriving a week earlier than they did even 50 years ago. That shows that they can adapt to things um, like changing climate. Um, so modern researching techniques help us to understand migratory uh, habits and behaviors. Here's some, a bird getting banned. That's American oyster catcher there on Long Island. Um, it's alleged that John James Audubon, who the Audubon Society is named after, was the very first bird bander, putting threads on a Phoebe's leg. In uh, early last century, um, the banding of waterfowl led to the definition of the four North American flyways, including the Atlantic fly, the way that, that, that I live in, um, and that, that, um, that so much of Audubon's work is, is based around. Um, we have eBird with our partners at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and Christmas bird count data to better understand bird distributions um, and geolocators like this little thing. Even just a few years ago, the geolocators were so uh, cumbersome and geolocators are used to, uh, to uh, birds wear them so we can follow, you know, track their movements. These things were so cumbersome that only the largest birds and raptors and geese could, could wear them, but now they're so small, even the smallest songbird can wear them. You know, even in fact, recently a great cheeked, uh, great cheeked thrush wore one of these, and amazed all of all of uh, the ornithology world when it was discovered that um, that thrush uh, traveled from Colombia and South America to uh, its breeding territory in Ontario in less than two days and in, in 46 hours, averaging 47 uh, miles an hour. I, I suspect it might have had a tailwind. Uh, but boy, that thing was moving. So. Um, So uh, just go over these three concepts real quickly. Occurrence, the map on the left shows, you know, just a di distribution in, in a period of time for, for a species of bird. It's observational data. It's what we see and what we can understand. When we use things like uh, banding data, we can, we can figure a re-encounter. It's okay. We can figure out the exact latitude and longitude of a bird when it's banded. And if it's recaught somewhere else, we can figure out where it was also. Um, however, it doesn't really tell the timing and the pathway. Pathways can be figured out by um, those geolocators. We can find out exactly the route a bird took during its migration, which can really inform the work that we do and commit our own resources properly. I'll show you real quickly, too. So there's the map I showed you before, the Bobolink range map with sort of those amorphous blobs about, you know, where their, where their ranges are. But the um, more pinpointed, more precise data, you can see that, you know, instead of a big blob in South America, we can see their winter distribution is primarily there in, in uh, I guess it's Paraguay and northern Argentina, and, and also uh, a lot more accurate data about where they are um, uh, in their breeding grounds. And, and even, even we can see it over time. Um, I'll play this really quickly. You can see here it is in the winter. There they are in their winning grounds in Central America. We can we can watch exactly how how they arrive um, through all this data and, and go back down. So um, what does all that mean? Um, well, our understanding of migration and stopover and, and you know informs our conservation act actions. You know it's you know we we're talking about resources being very important to why birds are migrating. But um, the commitment of the resources that Audubon and other conservation um, organizations have to protect and have our greatest impacts, you know, the more we know, the better we can do to protect these magnificent creatures. Um, there's a mag Migratory Bird Initiative. It's an emerging uh, Audubon program working with uh, a number of partners to better understand and respond to migratory issues. I think Ken's going to discuss this in a little further detail shortly. Um, Audubon has a robust uh, international alliances program. We're in nine countries with a goal to improve um, 10 million acres of habitat in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, Audubon, you know, we use this information to be involved in wind siting. I mean, we all support renewable energy, but Audubon works to ensure it's erected in sites to, you know, reduce uh, bird mortality. And the same goes for siting of solar energy grids for our grassland species. But the more we know about the actual routes that um, birds take, the better we can do to protect them. 
And then we're also heavily involved in lights out and bird friendly glass initiatives. You know, tens of millions of birds collide with buildings each year during migration, and it's a significant cause of population declines. It's not the only one, but it's an important one. Um, it's kind of counterintuitive, too, because you figure, okay, a bird can see that building and just fly out of the way, but um, just bird, the way the bird's nature is, they didn't encounter those as they evolved, and so they're actually drawn to those lights. So Audubon works with municipalities and cities to, um, to issue proclamations to turn our lights off, especially during peak migration. And then we also want to work in their stopover sites, not necessarily just where they winter and, and, and you know, where their breeding grounds are, but where they need to refuel. Uh, Audubon, for instance, was, work, was working with um, organizations in the Chesapeake Bay um, just a few years ago um, to limit the overfishing of horseshoe crabs because it was such an, the, the horseshoe crab eggs are such an important source of refueling for uh, a number of shorebirds as they go from South America to their breeding grounds in the Arctic. Um, anyway... Getting toward the end there, I just want to share with you some an inspiring message I just read um, from a friend of mine uh, on, on um, social media yesterday, Doug Gottschfeld. He wrote, he said, I won't be closely interacting with anyone for the next couple of weeks, but social distancing doesn't have to be a jail sentence. There are open spaces, even in this crowded city of ours. Immersing in nature, whether watching its seasonal progression or appreciating it, as it is in the moment, can be a great bomb for all the uncertainty that many of us are going through, even if you have to experience it in relative solitude. So, um, so me again, I, I, hope you, uh, I hope you get an opportunity to go out and enjoy and experience the migration that's going on around us now and as it peaks in the coming weeks. And um, with that, I'll hand it off to Ken. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rich. Uh, it's a great afternoon to get to meet all of you. And uh, all that science that Rich has been describing is really critical for Audubon and other con conservation decision makers. We can also use all this science for us to better understand where we can go out to observe bird migration and what birds will be out there when. And that's what I'm going to share with you over the next few minutes is a little bit of when the birds will be arriving uh, and where we might be able to see them and then our actions that we might be able to take to observe it and also uh, get to uh, help birds along their journey. So first and foremost is the, uh, our partners at Cornell Lab of Ornithology have taken the historic eBird data and weather forecasts and Doppler radar and they've been able to create migration forecasts. This is informing our Audubon chapters across the country on when they are going to be notifying the municipalities and the uh, building owners for lights out when it's most important. But for you as a bird watcher, you can go to this website, birdcast.info, and you can see which days there might be more birds arriving. Our timing or phenology of bird migration is also built into this website. So I'm just gonna share some uh, pieces that seasoned bird watchers have always known and when to expect certain birds. So spring migration is really the birds returning to their breeding grounds and their definition of spring is different than ours. So birds like red-winged blackbirds start to return to most of our area here in the Northeast in early February. And as the month progressed, we started to have American woodcocks and killdeer. And we also used the month of February into March to get to enjoy uh, waterfowl migration. Places like Montezuma Wildlife Refuge, where one of our Audubon centers is based, is one of those amazing spots of the Atlantic Flyway to get to see an amazing diversity of waterfowl and amazing numbers of them at the same time. But even your local pond every day might have a different species of waterfowl on it. Ringneck duck one day, wood duck the next. And here in Connecticut, I've seen lots of reports lately of pintails and shovelers starting to move through our area too. The month of April is interesting that some of those short distance migrants that uh, Rich was describing are still on their way north and then as the month progresses, I consider April the month of blues. It starts with the blue-gray net catcher arriving early in April, and hopefully by the last day of April, the first indigo buntings are arriving in our neighborhoods here in Connecticut and New York as well. The main event for bird watchers is May. 
It peaks around Mother's Day, and that's when most likely you're going to get to encounter this Cape May warbler. The birds are, have timed their migration to arrive back here in the Northeast in early to mid-May because that's when our trees are blooming and it attracts an abundance of insects. So going out and finding the blooming apple trees, magnolia trees, or even the trees that don't look like flowers, but oaks and maples have got flowering bodies on them as well. That's where you're gonna find the birds looking for insects. This phenomenon goes through the entire month of May and rounds out by Memorial Day, the last black pole warblers or olive-sided flycatchers and even some lingering shorebirds are still in our area till the end of the month. So if you have an idea of when the birds might be here, the question always is, so where can we go out bird watching? Where might we get to see more birds? In the spring, there's an amazing phenomenon of areas that we consider migrant traps. Famous ones are things like the cent is Central Park. You might have even heard of the phrase, the Central Park effect. That birds, as they're migrating, uh, the songbirds are migrating nocturnally. And as dawn arrives, they are trying to seek refuge for the day. And in places like New York City or other metropolitan areas, they see this gray jungle around them and they're looking for an oasis and Central Park is this big green space for them to approach. Or here in Connecticut we have East Rock Park. Not only is it green but it's elevated above the city so the birds can see that as they're over Long Island Sound and they can then aim for that spot and birders can find more species of birds. It's not only a hot spot for the birds but also for the birders. If you are in New York or New Haven Many urban parks act as migrant traps, and quite often it ends up being the cemeteries in a lot of our cities are a very great and productive bird watching spot. Also, there are geographic spots that end up becoming an interesting migrant trap. Places like Sandy Hook on the northeast corner of New Jersey is amazing on certain days in the spring. Also, Cape May, New Jersey, spots on Cape Cod, out west, there's McGee Marsh and Point Pele. It's not always in urban areas that there are abundance of birds all congregating in the same spot and using that same stopover habitat. If you live close enough to the coast, you can enjoy shorebird migration, which has already started that our oyster catchers and piping plovers are arriving daily now through the middle of March. Ospreys are starting to return along the coastline. But the shorebird migration really peaks between the full moon of May and the full moon of June. That's when those horseshoe crabs are at the peak of their egg laying season. And the shorebirds have also timed their migration for that abundance of food during their stopover here in the Northeast. A benefit of birding at the coast is that some mornings, if there's been foggy conditions or weather changes overnight, a lot of the songbirds that are migrating will end up uh, needing to seek refuge as soon as they approach the coast and we end up with we consider fallout conditions that you can actually find trees and bushes even in really sparsely pop uh, areas with very few vegetation and lots of houses you'll be surprised with how many birds might be there right along the coastline. If you don't live near an urban area or get to live near the coast Seeking out any site that has a mix of habitats can bring a greater diversity to the birds that you will see during the day. That we uh, have throughout this nocturnal migration, the birds are really spread out over the entire landscape. They aren't all flying in a highway like we might picture them, but instead they're spread out everywhere. So first thing in the morning, there are gonna be birds trying to seek a spot to land in any decent patch of habitat. Our Audubon centers, most of them happen to be in locations where there is a mix of habitats. You're looking at the Bent to the River Audubon Center in Southbury, Connecticut, which within 15 minutes of a walk, you can view the Pomperog River in a few spots, a meadow habitat, shrubland habitat, and two types of forest. So you can immediately get to see a variety of different birds. So just as you're thinking about spring approaching, look around for your favorite open space nearby and choose the ones that have a mix of habitats.
So a lot of birders seem to prefer spring migration rather than fall migration. And there are some benefits to that, but uh, for first of all, in the spring migration, birders are excited because each day could bring a new bird that they haven't seen yet for the year. Fall migration, the birds seem to be congregated and it's also weather dependent. It's not every day that migration is going on. In the spring, the males are more colorful, whereas in the fall, they tend to be in a non-breeding plumage. In the spring, we also benefit that the males are singing, even when they're stopping over. This week around our area, there are fox sparrows starting to sing and dark-eyed juncos singing on wintering grounds before they start to head north. There is one benefit of hawk migration, which I believe we'll probably have a webinar about as September approaches, is that hawk migration occurs midday. So the, you don't have to be the early birder to catch the early birds. Uh, you can enjoy it midday. I hope that you're able to get out this spring and enjoy migration. And as you're watching and listening to these birds, it might inspire you to think of ways that you can help birds on their journey. And I'm gonna share with you a few thoughts, becoming a community scientist, improving your local patches as stuff over habitat. There are many things that even our small buildings, our homes could be more bird safe and the idea that we can still advocate for birds and be the voice for them. As you're watching birds this spring, we highly encourage everyone to submit their observations to eBird. It is a major clearinghouse that all of our different conservation partners collect information from eBird. And while you might not think that you're seeing a lot of birds or that it doesn't seem to be a huge diversity of birds in your neighborhood, all of that data combined with the mass masses around us, all community members becoming scientists, brings about more information. And that's what makes those beautiful maps that Rich produced before. And that's what is going to feed our science team. The Migratory Bird Initiative team at Audubon is a new team and they're using information like the animations from eBird and some other special projects that they're helping to make decisions on which stopover habitats we need to protect now and which ones we will need to protect in the future. Also as a citizen scientist, think about uh, other projects that in New York and Connecticut, both of our states are in the process of developing a breeding bird atlas. Connecticut is in year three, New York is in their first year, and we're looking for volunteers in both states to go out. We've divided the state into tiny little squares to be able to create new maps of where the birds are breeding, where they might be breeding, and in which areas they are no longer breeding. Or, and uh, that will help be able to make a lot more conservation decisions in the future. So that's one very specific project that you could help out with even further. And both of those are collecting information through eBird. Your own backyard can be a piece of stopover habitat. I live in a fairly urban neighborhood in Southern Connecticut, but I have a few oak trees and I've considered other native plants to add to my yard that make it even more attractive to birds during the spring. We are dedicating an entire webinar later this spring to the concept of plants for birds. But if you wanna get a head start, you can go to our website and search for plants for birds. And this is the first page you will see. Enter in your zip code and the database will help you choose plants based on which birds you want to attract, what type of food source you're trying to provide for the birds, and also a little bit based on your conditions in your yard. It also has tabs to be able to help you with where locally you can purchase the native plants. Rich mentioned that bird migration is the deadliest part of a bird's life cycle, that we lose more birds during their migration than any other part of their life cycle. And one of those major factors is all the glass that we have produced on our buildings. Sadly, there are statistics that we may lose up to a billion birds a year from window collisions. You might not think that your windows are a problem because you haven't noticed much evidence, but the research is starting to show that they don't always leave a mark on your window. And there are many reasons why dead birds don't end up staying on the ground underneath your window very long. But as you can see from the window on the right, birds 
don't see the window because either they see a reflection of the habitat near them in the top of the window, or the bottom of that window is showing that they see straight through your house and out the window on the other side. So they think it's clearly a tunnel to go through. We have other information that leads us to believe that glass it may kill more birds than all the other human structures that we produce in North America and the pollution factors combined. There are some solutions that you can start to add to your windows right now. You might notice those, when those buses and certain storefronts have these huge wrapping uh, decals around them. And that material is great because it be it looks solid, but they also make it in a clear form. The kaleidoscape material, you might notice on the right side of that uh, picture on the left that there's little dots in there, and the birds can see the UV spectrum of light. And this clear decal can be placed over windows of different sizes. We see through it without any distortion, but the birds are then alerted that there is something there. On a smaller scale, there is bird tape that you can buy from places like the American Bird Conservancy. And there, there are guidelines on making sure you keep it uh, no more than four inches apart. You can make lines in different uh, directions, but the birds will uh, continue to fly through it if the decals are more than four inches apart. Another group called Feather Friendly has produced a tape where they've made small little dots that the birds can see and we barely can see them. So you can see both the inside and outside view of that material on these windows. Or we could get creative. If you have windows, like here we have some schools that we've worked with at Audubon that we simply paint on the windows. And if you're gonna put something on the windows, put it on the outside surface of the windows. That, that is where it distorts the reflections that might occur. If you aren't able to put anything on the windows, yes, closing the curtains can help a bit, but it, uh, it reduces the collisions with your window a small fraction, but we really need to put things on the outside less than four inches apart to really start to uh, absolutely prevent birds from hitting your windows. Here is a view that I'm jealous of. This is from the living room of one of our colleagues at Audubon, New York. And take a moment and see if you can notice what they have done to make their big, beautiful windows uh, more safe for birds. You might start to notice these black vertical lines. They don't really distort your view very much, but they are something called Acopian bird savers. It is simply paracord material that is hung outside by the gutters in front of the windows, and it is aligned at the four inch di uh, dimension and that helps the birds see that there's an object in front of them and that is statistically helping birds just as much as the decals. And lastly, I want to mention that we love the voices of the birds. We love hearing the bird songs. Unfortunately, in our communities, we need to become the human voice for birds. And a few things you can do is that we're going to put in the chat box as a link to Audubon's Action Network. And there you can sign up for alerts that as there are new programs coming out this year, uh, we expect some of them are going to be able to benefit bird habitat and we need to be able to uh, help local uh, decision makers encourage them to use these uh, new programs for birds. Also, you could at any time help write letters to the editor and we have templates for that on our website for that. And simple little things. If you really love native plants, you could be calling your local plant nurseries right now and asking them if they have native plants. If they don't, you could briefly explain the importance of native plants or simply just explain as a consumer, you're really looking for native plants and they should consider that as part of their stock in the future. I want to thank everyone for their time this afternoon, and we're going to open this up to a few of your questions. Please keep typing them in the chat box, and we're going to try and address them for you over the next few minutes. 
Thanks, Ken, and thanks, Rich, and to everyone joining us on this webinar, to everyone joining us on Facebook Live. We are so glad to have you here with us today. We hope that this inspires you to get outside and uh, start birding. And we've gotten a lot of great questions. Uh, for those of you in the webinar itself, please type them into the chat box. For those of you on Facebook Live, you can add them as a comment and we will get to them as fast as we can. Um, Rich, would you be able to go back to the migration maps while I answer two quick questions? And um, those are, first, uh, Ken mentioned the Acopian Bird Savers. That is spelled A-C-O-P-I-A-N. Those are the, uh, the, the black lines in the window that you saw. Uh, A-C-O-P-I-A-N. Um, these webinars are being recorded and uh, they are being published on our YouTube pages. That's Audubon Connecticut and Audubon New York YouTube pages, as well as our websites. You can go to each of our home pages and there will be a link to a homepage where we put all of our past webinars. Those will be available starting tomorrow. We just need a little time to get them up. Um, and all the resources mentioned today will be there too. So just go to either state's homepage and you'll find links below the big bird photo. Uh, we are getting a lot of great questions coming in. Uh, one of them is uh, about the breeding bird atlas in New York and Connecticut. I just wanted to clarify that in New York, uh, it's the third breeding bird atlas that has just started. It's in its first of five years. There is, again, an article about that on ny.audubon.org, and we definitely are looking for volunteers across the state. It's super easy. You just go out birding, and you take your phone and your eBird app with you, where you input the species that you see as well as any breeding behaviors that you see. And this helps inform a lot of important science that allows us to help birds and, uh, and learn more about them. So uh, you can go onto Audubon New York's website to learn more about that third breeding bird atlas and how to get involved. Um, Rich, someone had a question about these migration maps. I uh, was first of all wondering um, if all birds migrate north and south or if any migrate east and, and west and, and overall what this map is showing us. Okay, well, that's, no, no, that's a very good question. Yeah, primarily um, most migration, especially long distance migration, is primarily north and south. Um, there's quite a bit of east-west or northeast-northwest sort of migration, like we talked about when I was describing the um, the uh, chimney swift. After she after she crossed the Gulf, she went almost as a, at a at a northeasterly direction, almost at 45 degrees. But migration can take almost any um, any direction. I'll give an example. Um, there's another type of, of migration that we didn't talk about. It's more common in the tropics, but. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the bird dark-eyed junco. It's a fairly common winter feeder bird here in the Northeast. It's actually an altitudinal migrant, and, and meaning that um, in, in the summer or during the breeding season, it ends up being at higher elevations in our area, um, in the Catskills or the higher peaks in, in, in Connecticut or the Adirondacks. But in the winters, goes down in the valleys or you know close to sea level where, where I live um, to winter, and can go in any direction. But um, Primarily, you know, as we talked about, they, they follow ma um, uh, magnetic migrations and they're leaving places um, that have seasonal differences, you know, for resource management. Um, it tends to be mostly north and south. And I forgot to add that we also have uh, our Audubon Connecticut Director of um, Science on the call as well. That's Corey Folsom O'Keefe. Corey, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to this question of, of birds migrating north-south versus east-west. Sure. Uh, one thing I threw on the chat was that um, I would say that in, in uh, you know, the U.S. or North America, north-south is kind of the, the larger trend, but you certainly can have birds migra migrating east-west or west-east during sort of part of their migration. Uh, an example I gave is that on the Connecticut coast, for example, 
a lot of songbirds will be sort of coming down from uh, more northern states and then when they reach the Connecticut coast they go west uh, instead of flying out over the sound so they'll go west and then when they hit New York City they'll, they'll head south from there. Another sort of well-known sort of location where birds head uh, east or west versus going north in the spring is along the shore of Lake Erie. Uh, a lot of songbirds when they hit Lake Erie um, you know they instead of going across it they will head east or they will head west and go around it. So there are definitely east-west components to the north-south migration that we see in North America. Thanks everyone. Uh, this is a great question. I love this one. Um, so this is about what attracts birds to one spot versus another. The person who wrote in said, if you're familiar with Brooklyn Bridge Park, and I think we do see this in lots of other places, there are some areas that abound with birds, even rare ones like painted buntings, but others where I've never seen a single bird, even though both areas seem to have similar plantings. Can someone, um, maybe Ken or Corey, speak a little bit about why birds hone in on one spot versus another? Uh, sometimes it's uh, definitely related to geography, that uh, things on the southern side of uh, Long Island Sound might get some migrants, especially in the fall, but in the spring, it's the uh, north coast. So Connecticut and some sections, so it's that near the water might have more birds. Um, also, if it's elevated, that certain parks like East Rock Park, that the birds see it in a distance and they aim for it is something that happens a bit more. So sometimes if there's a taller building or a bridge in the way, that's going to obscure their view of being able to see that that site is there. Um, when it comes to then uh, having similar plantings, there could be other factors involved that um, if there isn't enough cover elsewhere nearby, then some birds might avoid that spot and they might have just stopped off and you didn't get to see them because they quickly moved to a spot they felt safer. And another thing that might impact uh, whether or not a bird stops in a particular habitat is what the surrounding habitat looks like. So, um, you know, in Connecticut, the, the Connecticut Audubon Society Birdcraft Museum just gets incredible diversity of warblers in the spring. Um, and it's because if you look at the surrounding habitat, there, there pretty much is no surrounding habitat. It's all very developed. So that small patch of habitat really concentrates birds. And the same is true for uh, uh, Central Park in New York City. So birds are passing over that area um, and there's really no other habitat beyond, except for Central Park and maybe a few other spots in New York City. So you really get a concentration of birds in those areas. All right, and questions about how different birds migrate. Like, does the hummingbird's migration differ from, say, songbirds and raptors? Um, it, you know, not just in in timing, but but for the reasons why they migrate. Well, this is Richard. You know, it, it, again, it's all about resources. So they're all going to have, uh, every species is going to have a little bit different, um, you know, biology or, 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 you know, reasons behind um, its timing or its destination or, or, how, or how it migrates. Um, you know, raptors, uh, raptors won't fly over water. Um, a lot of the migrant songbirds will, and so they take different routes. Um, hummingbirds obvi obviously have different challenges, as, as the smaller songbirds do, dealing with, uh, you know, prevailing winds and such. Um, but, um, you know, that all of their behaviors, every species' behavior is different, not necessarily individuals within the species, but they're all going to have different reasons for doing so. But it all comes down to, you know, the evolution and the natural selection that had, you know, those members of that species in that niche, you know, migrate at that particular time. Thanks, Rich. And sorry, uh, I just myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Um, so in in that same line of questioning, um, will the will any birds or will all the birds migrate earlier this year because we had a milder winter? Um, and overall, are, are warming winters changing how birds migrate? And maybe Corey or Ken wants to take this one. So, would, um, 
Go ahead, Ken, and I'll follow up. Uh, the short distance migrants uh, that are coming in February through early April, their times are probably adjusted more because of weather patterns, that they are triggered by temperatures and winds a bit more. The long distance migrants, the neotropical migrants that are in Central and South America, they're just preparing now based on day length to start their migration. And if they have the right winds, then they might be able to make that migration a couple of days sooner. That bird that Rich mentioned where the gray cheek thrush made it from uh, Colombia to Ontario in 47 hours or something. Other years, it may have taken that same bird for five days to make that same trip or even longer. So um, it, there's variation there, but overall, those birds are still migrating at the same times because it isn't the exact temperature or weather that's uh, triggering them to start their movement. Yeah, I would really concur with Ken that, um, you know, day length initially for neotropical migrants, uh, then temperatures, winds uh, can impact the rate of migration, um, but then also resources that are available and route. So take the red knot, for example, if they, uh, you know, come from, you know, South America and, you know, did, you know did land on the shores of, of the Chesapeake and Delaware Bay, um, but if horseshoe crabs haven't started spawning yet, um, they're going to have to wait for those resources to be available before they can continue their migration. And can someone clarify for us quickly, um, we're saying words like songbird, neotropical migrant. Um, can you just remind folks what those terms mean? Sure. Uh, I would say that, a, and, and Ken and Rich, feel free to jump in too, but I would say that a neotropical migrant is a bird species. And, you know, this can be songbirds, it could be shorebirds as well, but species that uh, spend their winter in the tropics, um, you know, Central America, South America, um, maybe Central, maybe the, the Caribbean as well, um, but then come to the United States during the, the summertime. Uh, and a songbird would be a, you know, basically a, a singing a bird that we would, would sort of see in, in our in our woodlands in our parks, um, you know, during the breeding season. Great, thanks, Corey. Um, this I think is a fun one. Why do solitary birds such as raptors migrate in groups? And are they really migrating in groups or are they actually migrating by themselves with a bunch of other birds around them? That is an interesting one. And I think it's the second part that uh, Sharon just mentioned that they are solitary birds and they have found conditions uh, favorable and they all seem to be taking uh, advantage of those favorable conditions at the same time. That hawks really are looking for uh, wind patterns and is things like thermals to help push them along so that they don't have to use as much energy during migration. And also the same thing is true of warblers. They are not flying in a flock. They are spread out all over the place and the other songbirds. But they are all noticing that there is a wind out of the south and it is pushing them northward. And that is why they're all migrating at what appears to be the same time in a large group. Yeah, that's a really good question too, because it just sort of it, it points out the fact that, you know, uh, you know, every day we're learning more and more about you know birds and their habits and their and their migratory um, habits and and um, but we don't know everything. Um, you know, they, they do cattle, they tend, they tend to, I would, you know, it's not a flock when, when they're together during migration, but broad-winged hawks especially is, is, a, is one species that definitely stays in groups of, of hundreds, if not thousands sometimes, um, as they migrate through Central America. You know, maybe, as Ken says, maybe it just happens to be the, you know, the perfect storm or the perfect weather, and it's just a coincidence that, that they're, they're in the same vicinity, but they seem to hunker down the same at night. So we're learning more. It reminds me, you know, um, the story I told about a chimney swift, you know, it was less than a, a lifetime ago when scientists thought, because we didn't know where they wintered, we didn't know they, they wintered in, in South America. Um, it wasn't discovered until uh, the, the late 1940s um, when, they, when they were found there to winter. It was thought, you know, it was almost like medieval when they thought that they buried themselves in the mud maybe in the winter. So, um, you know, we're learning more every day and, 
if we don't get too far ahead of ourselves and figure that we know everything, then we'll um, hopefully be able to help them even more on their on their journeys. Thanks, all. Um, so I am getting a few questions in the chat about particular birds. Do owls migrate? Do bald eagles migrate? Do wood thrush migrate? Um, and I just want to point everyone to this awesome resource on Audubon's website, which is the field guide. And the field guide will have a map of that particular bird's mi mi migration. And, um, and, and you can explore all of these different species on the Audubon field guide. And uh, that is very simply audubon.org slash field guide. Um, interesting question, do some birds migrate at night versus in the day? Or rather, sorry, why do some birds migrate at night versus in the day? And um, maybe Corey wants to take this one? Sure. Uh, so that is actually how they avoid predators. Uh, so I know we've talked a bit about hawks during the, the question er phase of this webinar. And the hawks are our daytime migrants. They need to sort of be able to see ridge lines, um, bodies of water as they're migrating. Um, songbirds um, choose to typically migrate at night and shorebirds do as well because uh, that's when the hawks are not migrating. So there's sort of less uh, predators uh, during the evening um, and they're able to use the, the stars to sort of guide their migration. Great, and I'm getting a lot of questions about feeding migratory birds, like very basically, should we leave feed out uh, for migrating birds? Should we leave out seed, uh, anything else, food for hummingbirds, and, and should that food go out earlier this year because the weather has been warmer? Maybe Ken wants to take this. The majority of the birds migrating through our area are not going to be seeking seeds. And uh, seed might help them more in a fall migration than it is helping to fatten them up for that migration. When birds are returning for the spring, they are looking for proteins to be able to rebuild that muscle that they just burned off. Uh, so having more plants for birds, grow your bird feeder rather than putting one out uh, is a long-term investment and so it's going to help you long term and it will actually attract much more diversity of birds and support a lot more different birds. Uh, you can look around that on Audubon's DIY section you can see things like putting out uh, orange halves so different types of fruit and uh, how to make an oriole feeder and how to keep a hummingbird feeder clean and proper for the birds are tips that we do have on there but that is one bird that um, is a migrant, but it is also returning to nest in your area. So that is one that you would consider feeding. But the majority of them that we've described today, we don't physically do anything to feed them per se, except increase the plants for them. Thanks, Ken. And um, let's go with one final question. And Ken, I'm gonna give this to you since you, you did speak about it. Um, and that is, what are the biggest human-caused risks to migrating birds, and has that worsened at all uh, in recent years? It's, uh, the factors have been looked at for quite a few years, uh, for decades actually, and things like high-tension power lines, uh, now we have uh, wind turbines, and that there are highways that are replaced, there's loss of habitat, um, are factors there, but windows actually equals all of those combined during migration period, it looks like. Um, and things like wind turbines are things that Audubon is trying to actively be involved with helping the decision process of where to site those so that they won't be much of a factor to birds uh, during their migration uh, in particular. So, um, I will try and see if I can send a, a link out uh, with that graphic I have. Uh, it's built into one of my other PowerPoints of those different factors, but those are the big three there. I always want to add one thing too. Thanks, Ken. This is Rich again. I just want to say too that um, 
You know, I, we, we spoke about Audubon and the broad part of Audubon. We're a national organization, but we also have a number of chapters, and uh, and, and they're very active in things like our Lights Out um, initiatives, like in New York City and, and other urban areas. So, um, you know, if, if you do live in an area with a chapter um, uh, and, and, and aren't a member of Audubon or aren't a member of that chapter but want to be active and help to protect birds, please reach out to them and, uh, and get involved as much as you can. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Rich. Corey, is there anything else that you want to leave us with? Um, no, not at this time, actually. So I think you're good. Well, great. Um, so again, everyone who has joined us here today, we will be posting as many resources as possible on our respective websites uh, and getting those up by tomorrow. This webinar is being recorded and will also be posted on the Audubon New York and Audubon Connecticut websites. It will be available on Facebook for everyone to watch in the future. Um, we thank you so, so much for joining and, you know, enjoy the outdoors. <laughs>